Good morning and welcome to Skadafa Library's Chats with Champions and today's guest, <laughs> Andrew Beats. Where did you go? Oh. <laughs> uh, we are grateful to our season sponsor, The First, and we invite you to attend our next chat on December 3rd with Rianne Waller, who is Professor of Marine Sciences at Darling Marine Center and a National Geographic Explorer. This morning's talk is being recorded, and we thank you for silencing all your cell phones and um, electronics, any kind of pagers, before we begin. Andrew's books will be available following the talk, and he'll be signing them, and we'll be right out there. Andrew Beats is the best-selling, award-winning author of six books, a former managing editor of Down East Magazine, a registered Maine guide and seasonal ranger in Baxter State Park, a husband and a father, and a freelance journalist. He divides his time between an old farmhouse on the coast of Maine and a small cabin in the deep north woods. His books include the critically acclaimed Boone Island, a true story of mutiny, shipwreck, and cannibalism, one of the most brutal survival stories in American history right off the coast of Maine. Full of blood and heart, drama and trauma. <laughs> he said that. <laughs> and it's true. A 2012 Book of the Year finalist, which is begging to be a motion picture. Becoming Teddy Roosevelt, How a Maine Guy Inspired America's 26th President, was a winner of the Silver Independent Publishers Book Award, a finalist for a Book of the Year Award, and honored by decree of the Maine State Legislature in 2010. With skillful storytelling ability and extensive research, research, the book opens a window on a different time with strikingly different attitudes about the world, nature, development, politics, and the roles people should play in their community and their country. Anyone interested in this American president's history should include Becoming Teddy Roosevelt on their bookshelves. Paul Guernsey, author and former editor of Fly, Rod, and Rio, says of Beats' just-released book, The Biggest Fish Ever Caught, quote, fishermen who strive for world angling records are of a strange and singular breed, part athlete, part artist, part predator, <coughs> part mad scientist, and totally obsessed. In this entertaining and exciting book, author Andrew Beats tells the stories of over a dozen modern-day Ahabs for whom landing the largest specimen of a particular species, everything from pirinas to largemouth bass to hammerhead sharks, looms larger than Mount Everest or the Nobel Prize. <laughs> and now without further ado, Chats with Champions proudly presents Andrew Beats. Wow, champions. <laughs> Well, first thing I wanted to ask was, well, I'd like to thank you all for coming and thank the library for having me. Um, and thank Nicole and the bookstore for, for their involvement, too. Um, but I'm wondering how many people here have, are familiar at all with the story of Blue Island? Maybe Ken for our version? Okay. Forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he probably should have titled his version Boondoggle. <laughs> Actually, I mean, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Kenneth Roberts and have read most of his works. Um, but in this particular case, when he goes searching for villains, I think he has the wrong uh, crew member. Um, so anyway, he, he gets most of the facts of the story correct. And, the, and in, essentially what happens with Boone Island was a ship goes aground on an island. Fourteen men are stranded for about a month in the middle of winter, well, not in the middle of winter, early winter. They, they suffer really grievously. They end up having to cannibalize one of their, their own crew members who died of natural causes. And then they're rescued. And when they're rescued, two different stories emerge. So the big question is, who's telling the truth? Kenneth Roberts takes one side. And Steven Erickson, who's the historian that I worked with on this project, and I took the opposite tack. Um, so but nobody really disputes the facts. And the facts are that. It's 1710, it's early December, December 10th, 
and the Nigam Galley, which was a 120 ton smallish vessel for crossing the North Atlantic, uh, goes, it's carrying cordage, which was meant to be ship rigging, and cheeses. And why cheeses need to go from, from Ireland to Boston, I'm not sure, but they had cheese, lucky that they did. And so it leaves London in September of 1710 to cross the North Atlantic to go to Boston with its cheese and its rigging. And Dilly Dally's in, in Ireland for, for a strange amount of time, which puts them late, uh, late in the season for a crossing. It's dangerous times to be crossing the North Atlantic. And they get into, they have pretty <coughs> lousy weather on the whole entire uh, voyage, and then when they get off the coast of Maine, it gets really dangerously uh, lousy. Uh, to the point where they can't see beyond their, their decks, basically. And on the night of December 10th, very heavy seas, very high winds, snowing, sleeting. They can't see, as I said, they're, they're shrouded in fog, can't see where they're going, and they go around on Blue Island. Um, the ship starts to sink pretty, pretty immediately. They cut the masts of their boat, drop them on Boone Island. All 14 men are able to scramble off onto the island safely. In doing so, they're doing water up to over their waists, so you know they're, they're quite cold. It's quite windy, and they huddle together in the dark uh, on Boone Island for that first night. And not really knowing whether they what they've hit. They don't know if they're on an island, they don't know if they're on the mainland. They don't know if it's a big island, a small island, they, they really just, it's dark, they don't, there's not much that they can tell until dawn. Uh, it's another lousy day, they can't see very far, but they can see the confines of the island. And it's about a soccer field wide, 300 feet, by 700 feet long, so not a very large place. Um, it's about 15 feet tall at its highest point above sea level. And it's essentially a jumble of boulders. I mean, there's not much to it. Um, not, there's no vegetation, which is very alarming to these guys because they know what that means, that it can be inundated in storms. And of course, no, no, nothing to burn. Um, there's no outcroppings or anything for cover. It's essentially just a, a, a mound of boulders. And so they, they realize they're in great distress. And they, they, by the time they wake up, the boat's completely vanished. There's a few supplies that have washed up on shore. Um, they're able to gather some, some, some uh, sailcloth. They find a few cheeses, which is one of their salvation, basically. Um, and they're able to find pieces of, of the ship itself, some wood scraps. And basically, that's all they could, they could come up with from a 120-ton vessel. Um, so they're, they're in sort of dire straits, and within the first couple of days, one member of the crew, uh, the ship's cook, dies. So one down and out of 14. Um, they end up spending the better part of a month on the rock with nothing much more than those cheeses that they found and some uh, seaweed, mussels, things that they can scavenge out of the water. But within, within a week and a half or so, they're, they're hardly able to move. Only a few of them can actually physically leave the tent that they had built out of the sailcloth and move around. So they're in, uh, it's a, it, few, few sailors I think have ever been in quite this kind of predicament. Most of the guys that have that, that you know, the famous stories like South and, and whatnot, um, in, the, in the North Pole or the, or the South Pole, most of the people that, that what, what typically happened is that boats would get mired in ice and they would have all the provisions aboard. These guys jumped ship with virtually nothing and they, they didn't even have overcoats or anything. They had just woolens. Um, so they were, they were in a very harsh uh, circumstance. So that's the, that's the bare bones of the story. That's the basic... Um, that's what both sides agree to, let's just say. And so it's one of the great mysteries uh, in, of the story and of history, actually. I mean, this, is, this was a, a worldwide sensation, this story, in the 18th century. It was the most famous 
uh, maritime disaster until the mutiny on the bounty happened in the late 18th century. So it was a sensation worldwide. Everybody had heard of it that, that was anywhere near the coast. And of course, the reason that it was a big sensation was because they ended up cannibalizing a crew member. Um, so there was a sort of horror element to it. And because of that, the sensation, both parties involved, the captain and these three crew members that, that ultimately end up challenging him, they wanted to make sure that their stories were straight, so they, they, they wrote down published narratives about the tale. So you have these two competing reports that still exist, that you can still you can go on Google and find both sides. Um, so it's a great mystery. It's, uh, we, uh, Stephen and I sort of saw it as a uh, why done it, basically. Why, why did this ship end up wrecking on the shores of Rhode Island, six miles off the coast of York? Um, and who's telling the truth? And so we're looking at it 300 years later. And it's kind of tricky to find the truth. And Kenneth Roberts came up with his own truth, which was largely fiction. And uh, we came up with the truth that we think has, has roots in what actually happened. Um, so I, I decided the best way to go about this was to set this up as borrowing the structure of a mystery novel. So we open with a body. It's, it's uh, January 1st, so New Year's Day, 1711, and the county coroner of York, which is then part of Massachusetts, is dispatched to the beach because a body has washed ashore. Or there was a body on shore, let's just say. Someone found a body on the beach. So this is d during what in the colonies we call Queen Anne's War, um, part, well, part of the broader French and Indian Wars, right? When the French and the English are fighting for North America. And so York, finding bodies in York was not all that uncommon, unfortunately. The, that, the village of York was one of the harder hit places in New England by the natives. And so the, the kind of corner when he finds his body on the beach, the first thing he's got to think is, did the Abnakis get another one? And it, he, pretty quickly he ascertained that that wasn't the case. He could see that the man had very, very little in the way of clothing, and he had an unruly beard, and he looked pretty gaunt and thin, and he had what were called chill lanes, which are a source from frostbite all over his body. So, this, you know, there's a few clues here to, to this corner, and he's looking around and he sees a raft eventually washed up on the beach. So he pieces it together that this gentleman obviously came off the water on this raft. And when, and that, and that day, for ages actually, until even, even today, everyone in York knows if, if there's a shipwreck where it's likely to have been. Boone Island, because ships have been wrecking on Boone Island since forever, since, since boats were invented. Um, so he hurries to Cape Medic and puts together a rescue party. And they, they make the voyage out to Boone Island. Like I said, it's about six miles out. Uh, six tantalizing miles because the, uh, the crew could see the houses of York. They could see the smoke coming from chimneys. They could see boats going in and out of the harbor. Um, so they, you know, it's just, just beyond their grasp. But on this particular day, their, their luck is with them, and the county coroner makes it out to Boone Island with, with a crew of fishermen from York. And he can't, of course, land on Boone Island because it's so treacherous. And so what they do is put in a, a canoe, a small vessel, and paddle over to the island. And one of the fishermen from York goes and talks to the survivors. And they're just absolutely astonished that anybody is alive on Blue Island in January with no fire. And he uh, talks first to this gentleman who introduces himself. He's one of the few uh, that is upright. And he uh, introduces himself as Captain John Dean. And he explains that he's from, from, uh, from England. They were headed for Boston with cordage and, and rigging. And on the grounds, and they've been there about three weeks. Four men are now dead or <laughs> left on the raft. They didn't know what happened to the two that left on the raft. But a total of four are, are no longer with the crew. And um, he, he says, come take a look at the men in the, in the tent. And so he goes back, the tent flap, and the man is just aghast at the sight of 
these uh, 10, fellow, well, 10 or 11 fellows, there were a couple that were still standing. Um, but they're all stacked almost like cordwood on top of one another for warmth, and that was the only thing that kept them alive was, was body heat, being so in, in such compressed space with a tent to retain the heat. Um, but they start crawling at him, you know, sort of begging him to, to remove them from this place to save them. And, he, you know, he feels terrible, but they didn't bring any food. I think they didn't expect, they, nobody, nobody can figure out quite why he would go on a rescue mission with no food, but I think they figured there would be no survivors because they had never seen any smoke from the island. Uh, they had never, um, they didn't hear any shots of distress or anything like that. Nobody had a clue that his vessel went down. And so what he does is he lights a fire for them, and which, you know, it's, they, they really appreciate, and then he has to apologize and say essentially that he cannot rescue them at this time because it's not safe to do so. The seas are getting heavier, uh, it looks like another storm is coming. So they, the county coroner and the fishermen, they, they end up taking off, leaving the stranded men of Blue Island stranded still. So that's, that was New Year's Day. They end up taking their, their fishing boat back to uh, to Cape Medic, and just as they are trying to come ashore, their boat wrecks. Oh, no. oh. And so that, that's how the chapter ends. <laughs> <laughs> do they make it? <coughs> they do make it. They wrecked right close to shore and were able to go ashore and um, alert the authorities that there are 10 men stranded on Boon Island. So they ready a bunch of larger vessels to go get them, but of course they're stuck because this, the storm is still raging and it goes for four days. So the men on Blue Island are, you know, they're despairing again after a couple days and nobody comes back for them thinking, you know, are we going to be rescued ever here? Um, so there was a lot of despair in Blue Island. Um, so eventually they, they are rescued, they, they take them back to uh, Portsmouth. And it's kind of where things get interesting because the captain, and aboard there was the captain, his brother, who was, who was the owner of the vessel, the captain, uh, his brother, and they had another merchant investor. So there were three gentlemen aboard, and the rest were crewmen, sailors. Um, so the three gentlemen are taken to nice homes in Portsmouth, and the remainder of the crew is sort of shuffled off to what they called a tavern, but I imagine it was probably an inn, to recuperate. And so a doctor shows up at the, at the tavern and starts doing amputations. Um, and they start nursing these, these guys back to health. Some of them are, as you can imagine, after three weeks of hardly any food and freezing, in pretty rough shape. And so while they're recuperating, the captain goes to a sea captain's house that he knows, actually, from the world of shipping. And as he arrives at this house, they do the same sort of thing. They, they moor the vessel and they take a smaller uh, rowboat or some sort, some sort of dinghy tender, to shore. And the captain, when he hits shore, leaps out of this boat, runs across the lawn, and lets himself into the house and starts immediately rummaging through the kitchen cabinets looking for food. And he terrifies the, the captain, the, the captain's wife, the homeowner, and her two children. And the men, the captain, and a couple of other uh, of his crew have to restrain Captain John Dean of the Nottingham Galley so that he doesn't gorge himself because it's not, it's uh, very uh, unhealthy when you've had nothing in your stomach for, for so long to eat uh, massive quantities. So they get the captain settled into the house, they feed him, they start bringing him back to health, and he starts to do this Interesting thing, he doesn't, he doesn't seem too concerned about his crew, he doesn't go to visit his crew. What he does do is he starts writing what's called a protest, which is a, an insurance document that you have to write when a vessel goes around. It's, it's true today. Um, captains, when, when, they, when a ship is wrecked, they have to write, you know, essentially what happened for insurance purposes, it's called a protest. So he seems obsessed with this protest. He can't get to it quick enough. He starts writing his protest, and meanwhile he, he's introduced to a gentleman in, in Portsmouth who's a magistrate or a judge. And the judge tells him that Cotton Mather, who was probably the most famous resident of New England at that time, Puritan minister in Boston, 
he wants to he wants to sermonize about the wreck of the Nottingham Galley, and would the captain please send his story down there? And it has to be accurate and in as great detail as, as possible. So the captain is writing his protest, and he's writing a manuscript for for Cotton Mather. So he's busy in his house, in, in the house that he's staying in, uh, writing his protest, finishes it up, and after several days takes it over to the to the tavern. He'd like to get his crewmen, the ranking members of his crew, to sign off and say, yep, that's exactly what happened. He goes to the first mate, Christopher Langman, who is gripped by fever at this point, says, you sign here, please. So he signs. Um, he's sort of out of his head, and he signs. Then he goes to the bosun and says, sign here, please. And the bosun does an interesting thing, which in, in the great mystery novel, it's sort of one of the, the hints of menace. He, he confronts the, the captain and says, I wouldn't sign anything that you put in front of me. And he essentially screams in his face that you're, you're a liar and a scoundrel, and it's because of you, you know, that we've ended up in these circumstances. So the people of Portsmouth are sort of taken aback. What, what, what is going on here? And the men don't usually challenge their captains to their face like that in public. And you know, it, what's the backstory here? You know, it seems like there's something going on on, on that boat and then on that island. So the captain essentially ignores the bosun and turns to another member of the crew and says, okay, you're the bosun, you sign here. So the other gentleman signs, so he has the signatures he wants and he leaves. And his men, meanwhile, recuperate. And a few days later, when they are feeling much better, when Cap uh, Christopher Langdon, the first mate, feels much better, he's aghast to find out that he had signed the, doc the, the document that the uh, captain had put in front of him. So they do an extraordinary thing. Three of, three of these men, the, the first mate, Christopher Langdon, and the two bosuns, go to see this magistrate, and they say, we, we didn't sign, we, you know, we never would have signed that if we knew what we were doing, we were sick, we'd like to take up depositions uh, and, and tell our side of the story because the captain's a liar and a scoundrel. So they, they take out depositions, which again is something that you can find. And they accuse the captain of wrecking the ship on purpose for the insurance money. And one of the crew members says that he overheard, overheard the captain saying to one of the investors on the board. And, and another question is sort of raised, why is there an investor on board? Usually investors who have all kinds of money don't cross the North Atlantic in, in a you know, uh, late season, let's just say, and not the best time for, for sailing on a small vessel. Um, but anyway, the captain supposedly was overheard saying that he had, yes, he had taken care of the insurance, and yes, the boat is overinsured. So at least two people corroborated that story, and they're under oath when they do so. Um, so that raises all kinds of questions, and, the, and this magistrate is just kind of he doesn't know what to make of things now. Usually, it was very, it was very, there was not a lot of precedent for a crew taking out depositions against their captain. And um, essentially, it, it, it amounts to a mutiny on land. But um, the story that the crew tell is quite different than the, the story that the captain tells. What, what happened when they, when they left from London, they went to Ireland to pick up the cheeses. And again, why, why cheese to New England? I, I think New England had cows by the <laughs> by 1711. But anyway, they go to Ireland. As they're crossing from, from England to Ireland, they encounter a French privateer. And when they encounter this vessel, of course, remembering that it's, it's, it's wartime and French privateers are preying on English ships. So they have a convoy of vessels that this crossing from England to Ireland, and it's, it's escorted by Navy ships. So, you know, arm, armed escort, essentially. And Captain Dean decides he doesn't want to wait around with this convoy, and he peels off. So he's alone, essentially, on his way over to Ireland. And as he does so, a couple of French, well, a French privateer vessel peels off, too, and we're to follow him. And as the men said, uh, in the account of the men, the captain essentially throws up his hands and says, oh, it looks like we're taken. 
he, he, they, they could have made a run for it. They ultimately end up making a run for it because the first mate says, well, we're not being taken, essentially, and he, he takes command of the ship and he takes it to Ireland, um, which essentially is a mutiny. Um, but everybody sort of glosses over it, then nobody talks about it. Um, and it, it happens again. So there's two times when it looks like this vessel is going to be taken by the French, and two times the captain seems to be like, oh, nothing we can do about it, uh-oh, you know, here they come, they prepare for boarding. And all the men are just struck, because they know what will happen to them if they're taken by the French. They'll be thrown to rot, in, thrown in prison, to rot, and the captain will be treated as a gentleman and be free to roam. Um, and he'll also probably make some money from the, the stuff in the hole from the insurance company. So the captain has something to gain from losing the ship to the French. The man had nothing to gain from losing the ship to the French. So um, they make it to Ireland, and then they spend about a month in Ireland looking for cheese, apparently. <laughs> and the big question is, were they looking for new crew members? Was the captain unhappy with, with, with his men for having challenged him? Um, why would you wait? <laughs> there, there, didn't, there, there doesn't seem to be any explanation for why the boat would be sitting in Ireland for this length of time, which pushes them, you know, it pushes them later into the sailing season. It makes it more dangerous to cross, right? So, one of the things the men suspect is maybe the captain's looking for another way to get his ship taken by the French. Um, so, um, they, they dilly-dally in Ireland for way too long, and then they end up crossing to go to North America, as planned. And once they leave Ireland, the captain starts doling out some corporal punishment for the actions of the crew. And, and so he, he basically beats several members of the crew to near death, according to the, the, the crew's accounts. And then he puts them on unlimited rations for so water and food he, he withholds for much of the crossing. So they make it all the way across, and as I said before, the, the voyage was beset by storms and really la lousy weather the whole entire way. They make it to, uh, to French Canadian waters, and they come upon a vessel. And the captain says to the men, all right, why don't you guys, you know, we, we, we're, they, they still don't, he claims he didn't know where they were, the captain. But they see the ship, he thinks it's a French privateer. He tells the men to go down and get some, uh, get some, something to drink. And by that he meant rum. Um, so he gets the, the crew drunk. And he puts on his fancy wig and his nicest clothing to be taken, not not to be taken, but to, to, to have a meeting with his other vessel because he thinks it's a French vessel, because it's from French Canadian waters, right? Well, it turns out it's an English ship, and he's very embarrassed. And they're kind of, the other captain's probably looking at the men having a party on board, and the <laughs> captain in his fancy wig, you know, wondering what, what's going on here? So they push off from there, after visiting a little bit with their English uh, comrades, and they push off from there to follow the coast down to the Gulf of Maine. And when they get to, um, they get roughly the Kennebongs, um, there's a big to-do on, on the deck because first mate Christopher Langman says to the captain, our course is too, too close to, uh, to the mainland. We need to push out farther to sea because the storms are coming on and we, we don't want to be you know, this far inland. Uh, we need to push out to sea where it would be safest to take on these storms. And the captain tells uh, Langan basically to go to hell. And um, a little while later, they, they see the coast of Maine for the first time. And because of the, the uh, clouds from the fog parts, and the captain says, well, let's have a little celebration. Why don't we go, and go down below and get water? I'm going to go down below and get water. And we can celebrate sighting land for the first time. And the men are thinking, well, we actually saw land when we hit Newfoundland, but whatever. And 
So the captain goes down below. He comes back with a, not a bottle of water, but a block of wood. And he comes up behind the first mate, and he hits him three times on the head, brutally, so that he collapses on the, on the, on the deck, all in gore, according to the men, and left, he's left for dead. Um, so he, he ends up, uh, the men take him down and put him in his cabin. And so the first mate is in his cabin. He's the most able seaman on, on this vessel. And he's down below recuperating. Well, as he's recuperating, uh, the waves start to pick up. And the wind starts to pick up. And the storm starts to howl. And Christopher Mellon, I'm, I'm sorry, Nicholas Mellon, who's the bosun, who's the one that had the set to with the captain in, in who will have the set to with the captain in Portsmouth, goes down below to get Langman because he's afraid that they're, they're too close to shore. So Langman goes up on deck, and the captain this time pulls a pistol on him and says, you're relieved of your duties, you can go below. Um, I would never listen to anything that you have to say. Um, and uh, it, kind of, you know, Langman is sort of begging the captain to take the boat farther out to sea, farther out to sea, farther out to sea. And the captain refuses, dismisses Langman, and then later that evening, uh, it, there's a horrible crunch. And they hit Moon Island. So, according to the men, when they do so, the captain panics, freaks out, and he's unable to, to, uh, to, to marshal the resources to uh, kind of compose himself enough to lead the men to safety. And according to the men, it's Christopher Langman, covered in gore, who comes from his cabin, probably with a concussion, um, and orders the men to fell the masts, and he's the first one to crawl out across the mast to make sure it's safe. Um, so, according to the account of the men, Christopher Lang is the hero. And Captain Dean is, uh, he's a liar and a scoundrel, and, and he kinda, he's not much of a captain at all. He falls apart when, uh, when things go, go bad. And so they, they, once they get ashore, everybody kind of agrees for the most part on, on what happens then until the cannibalism incident. Uh, in the middle of a night, about three, 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 three and a half weeks in, about three weeks in, um, the ship's carpenter dies of exposure. And he's in the tent, and the captain <coughs> orders his men to remove the body, and his men are sort of too weak to do so, so they refuse his orders. And he says, fine, I'll do it myself. He pulls the body out of the tent, climbs back in the tent to, go to sleep because he's exhausted himself just in doing, doing that much, removing the body. And he, uh, as soon as he enters the tent, he says the men implore him to use the body for, for sustenance, to carve up the body and serve it to them. And that, that's the captain's version. The crew say it was the captain's idea. And he was the one that proposed carving up the body, consuming the carpenter. Regardless, the captain goes outside and butchers the body. He, he, he was an apprentice butcher way back. And serves it to the men with a little seaweed, which he calls bread. And the meat is beef. And they have to eat it raw because they have no fire. So the men are, they feed. And uh, the captain says that the behavior of the men changed after they, they did such a, a, a dark deed. And, and the men, again, accuse the captain. They say, no, it was your behavior that changed. Um, and the captain said that he had to guard the meat so or the men would sneak out of the tent to go gorge on it. But of course, at this point, most of the men can't move anyway. Um, and so they, the, the crewmen say, no, that's not what happened at all. Um, most of the men can't even move. So there was a big discrepancy in the eating of the carpenter. Uh, so then the men are rescued. Ultimately, they, the, the men take depositions out against the captain. The captain writes his manuscript. And they all go back to London. And the captain's brother calls up these three crewmen, who he, they had, the captain had the most trouble with, and says, I'd like to meet you in a tavern and have you read something. So they go and they read, and they want the the captain and his brother want the, the men to sign off on the captain's version of the account, and they refuse to do so again. 
And not only that, they, they vow they are going to write their own account and set things straight. So they publish their own account, and Captain John Dean is sort of disgraced in the, in the social circles of London. And he loses his reputation and ends up leaving the country and going to work for the Russian Navy as a spy. <laughs> and his first mission for the Russians is to take a vessel from, from Archangel over to Norway, through very cold waters, obviously. And by the time the boat docks in Norway, half the crew is dead. So, and he's, he's, this didn't even bring him all that much disgrace in the Russian Navy. But other actions that the captain did bring him disgrace in the Russian Navy, so he returns to England, and he becomes a spy for the English on the Russians. So, it just kind of raises questions about his character that he can, um, you know, play both sides all the time. Um, so basically, he, uh, the captain survives until his 80s, dies. Nothing after the men published their story, nobody knows exactly what became of Christopher Langman uh, and Nicholas Mellon, I'm sorry, George Mellon. Nicholas, uh, why am I blanking on his name? George Mellon, George White, Nicholas Mellon, and Christopher Langman. So, uh, nobody knows what became of them after their manuscript comes out. Uh, but it seems that they won the War of the Words. And so, that's a, the gist of this book. It reads like a mystery novel, um, hopefully. And it, uh, it, it's a page turner, so. I'll be happy to take any questions. Yes. Yes, ma'am.